Good afternoon. I'm David Wessel. I'm director of the Hutchins Center at the Brookings Institution. And I'm very pleased to join with our partners at the Rosenberg Institute of Global Finance, the Brandeis University International Business School, the Olin Business School at WashU in St. Louis, and the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago to kick off our uh, ninth annual Municipal Finance Conference, which seeks to bring together academics, people in the municipal bond business and public sector officials to think about both the municipal capital markets and state and local fiscal issues generally. Um, I'm sorry we have to do this virtually this year, but it does mean that we have a somewhat broader audience. You can watch the majority of today's sessions right here on this event page. There are my interview in a few minutes with Mary Libby Schaff from Oakland and two subsequent panels on COVID, the state and local response followed by the muni bond response and outlook. At 345 Eastern, we'll head to two concurrent breakout sessions. These will take place only on Zoom. If you registered, you should get an email. If you didn't register and you wanna get the Zoom coordinates, uh, you can email my colleague, Stephanie Sensula, that's S-C-E-N-C-U-L-A at brookings.edu or events at brookings.edu and they'll send you the details. A reminder, um, we'll start the, tomorrow morning at 8.30 Eastern with breakouts and then convene again plenary at 10.15. Um, and if you have any trouble, just let us know. We'll try and sort everything out. So uh, I'm very pleased to have Libby Schaff join us today. She's the mayor of Oakland, which is, I've learned, the 45th largest city in the United States, 433,000 people. Of the 482 cities in California, Oakland is among 14 with that are rated AA1 by Moody's. That's second only to a AAA rating. And in February, when they rated the city, they talked about the very strong fiscal position, strengthened fiscal policies, experienced prudent management, I guess that means you, Mayor, and said they were well positioned for its clear fiscal and social challenges, including increasing pension costs, sharply increased homelessness, and declining housing affordability. And that was all before COVID. Uh, Libby Shaft is a native of Oakland. She ran for class president her senior year at Skyline High School and lost, but she's been winning elections ever since. She's a lawyer. Uh, she's been involved in local governments and starting a volunteer program in the public schools in 1995. Uh, and she spent a couple of years in the mid 2000s as a special assistant to Jerry Brown when he was mayor of Oakland, which must have been interesting. Uh, Libby Shaft was elected to the city council in 2010 elected mayor in 2014 in the only in California 14th round of ranked choice voting. Um, she had quite a first term. There was the ghost ship fire that killed 36 young artists and musicians, uh, prostitution scandal in the police department, the Oakland Raiders decided to leave for Las Vegas and the municipal workers went on strike. For reasons that defy logic, she decided to run again for office and was reelected in 2018. Uh, just in time to handle uh, COVID and Black Lives Matter. Um, Libby Schaff and her husband, Sal, who's a physicist and software engineer, have two kids who attended the very same public school, elementary school that she did. And so we're very help happy to welcome her to the Municipal Finance Conference. Um, so Mayor Schaff, I thought perhaps it would be useful to start with COVID. Um, as, a, as sitting atop a city government, a city the size of Oakland, how has COVID affected you, in addition to the obvious public health challenges, in a, in a budget sense? Well, fiscally, we immediately had to cut $122 million out of a 14-month period in, in our budget. And that's so how, big again, the, we were, how big is the budget? That's, uh, our budget is about uh, $1.6 billion. So, you know, percentage wise, I mean, that's a lot of money, but percentage wise, it wasn't catastrophic, uh, but it is literally the biggest cut we've ever needed to make immediately. You know, there was no easing into this. Uh, our revenues, you know, several revenue categories just fell off a cliff. Now we had, uh, when I became the mayor, we started a rainy day fund. And luckily that had done relatively well because of Oakland's real estate boom. Our, our rainy day fund is actually tied to our real estate transfer tax. So it's very unpredictable, but it had been doing well. 
And so we took this opportunity and it's a tremendous risk. And, and believe me, I, I was practically crying because all the good fiscal policies that you mentioned that got us that, that credit upgrade, we really, uh, we either suspended them to, to make this budget cut, or like I said, we cleaned out our rainy day fund, both from this current last fiscal year and this current fiscal year to get us through but the good news is we did not lay off a single person. We did not freeze all our positions. We did freeze some of them, but we were able to be very strategic and surgical. And that is allowing us to get through this year because at the end of the day, at the moment when our budget has been most impacted is the moment that our residents need us the most. We are in this economic meltdown our people are not working, they're frightened, they need our support now more than ever. And so uh, I really wanna hand it to my finance staff. Adam Benson is our director of finance who has uh, just been a wizard of really thoughtfulness because uh, we have got to continue to think about the long term. We have taken a risk. We did a lot of one-time revenues funding ongoing uh, services and, and salaries, which, which is a no-no. <laughs> but we felt like this crisis um, warranted that. But we are holding our breath with the hope that you know this is the V recovery, that we are gonna recover relatively soon and relatively quickly. Um, next year, we're going to have to make some much harder decisions if that, in fact, does not come to pass. When you say next year, so you're in, you're, you're now in fiscal year 2021, right? So the budget. Yes, comes. we just uh, started our new fiscal year. We just passed our new budget. Although um, I will, I will tell you that our city council voted to schedule a, a potential revision of the budget in response to all the protests and the calls for defunding the police. So uh, I am advocating for no financial changes. There could be some policy changes, but uh, I am very worried about um, kind of responding to a huge amount of political pressure with something that really needs to be um, constructed in a way that keeps the long term, not just the moment uh, in mind. But I thought your city council had voted to cut the police budget by 14 million from the 300 million. Is that not a final decision? <laughs> uh, we shall see. The city council okay. always has the authority to do further revisions to the budget after they've passed it. And we did. We cut $14.3 million out of the police department. And much more importantly, we funded more than $2 million to create a new non-law enforcement response system. And that is something that I think we're gonna see cities across the country doing. To create some, something that can respond to 911 that does not have a gun and a badge, but our trained medics, our trained um, crisis uh, intervention specialists, therapists that are more uh, trauma informed and are there to provide care uh, not not arrest, not law enforcement. And so in Oakland, we're calling this macro. I know we, we've actually been preparing for this for over a year. So we started this long before this particular movement, long before the tragic murder of George Floyd. Uh, but I think lots of cities are going to be looking to create this new type of trauma-informed response that is not so tied to law enforcement. So these will be new hires, a new core of people who are non-police intervention specialists? It will be. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if we're going to be linking in with, for example, our community health clinics, um, organizations that already have ties and relationships and trust built within certain communities. Uh, for example, Oakland has a large undocumented worker community. Often these people are afraid to call the police. And so to have culturally competent, trusted people available to respond, we actually might get more people reaching out to government in their time of need so that we can help them. Interesting. So it seems to me uh, that times like these, there are two things that happen simultaneously. One is one has to respond to the crisis, whether it's COVID or 
uh, Black Lives Matter. And then the other is to say this can accelerate reforms and changes. You referred to it in a conversation we had earlier as, as it seems a little weird, the silver lining of a crisis like this. So what kind of things are you thinking about that you can do or should do uh, in Oakland, given that we have this moment where people are open to changes that six or nine months ago they might not have been open to? Well, first of all, I believe that a crisis like COVID, at least in Oakland, I am telling you, it has unleashed the entrepreneurial bureaucrats within right. our organization. How many of and those are there? <laughs> there are tons of them. Release them. <laughs> you know, set them free. They're amazing. Um, and, you know, I'll give you a, a very simple example. Our Department of Transportation realized that they had all this traffic analysis that they had done for our bike plan. And we repurposed that analysis to create the Slow Streets program. Uh, we identified immediately 74 miles, it's 10% of the roads in Oakland that could be used for what we call you know, appropriate, healthy, socially distanced exercise. So we've begun every weekend, we've shut off a number of streets to through traffic. It's still available for local traffic. Your Amazon delivery will get there, uh, but it's closed off to through traffic. So families and, and neighbors can walk around the neighborhood and it's helped us relieve the pressure on our popular parks. We have a beautiful lake in the middle of our city that has been getting overcrowded, which is terrible during COVID. So, I mean, that is silver lining thinking, but the bigger pieces are really to recognize how COVID is just shining a hot spotlight on racial inequality, on our structural racism, the way that our systems, our policies, our practices are, you know, regardless of the good intentions of those of us in local government, we are continuing to preserve and in many cases exacerbate these inequalities. And so we have this crisis called COVID. Can we use this as we're getting people to come to free community testing sites because they are afraid of, of death? Can we use this as an opportunity to connect people that didn't have a health home at all with a long-term permanent community health home? Can we take this moment where families, their, their children cannot get education without the tools for distance learning? Can we take this moment to close the digital divide for good, not only because every child deserves to continue their education, but because in this day and age, your employability your ability to access information, public benefits is so uh, restricted if you do not have digital connectivity. And so for example, in Oakland, we launched something called Oakland Undivided. And in six days, we raised $13 million from, from philanthropy. And I want to do a special shout out for Jack Dorsey, the founder of Twitter and Square, who personally donated $10 million of his personal money so that we can get a device, an internet connection, and most importantly, technical support into the homes of the 25,000 Oakland Public School student families that had no connectivity. Mm -hmm. And that technical support is key. But I will say because of COVID, because of sheltering in place and because of distance learning requirements, these families will never have a larger motivation to actually adapt and learn technology. So I know that sounds like a terrible silver lining, but these are the types of opportunities that we have to take advantage of in a way where we're not just responding to the crisis, but we are doing some long-term changes so that when we come out of this, we can return not to business as usual, but to a more equitable, just society. And you think that the municipal government of the size of Oakland has the resources to address all those issues? 
Listen, we have to have, you know, an abundance mindset. And uh, I believe that the only way we're going to change the world is through public-private partnerships. Um, again, COVID, I believe, has, has kind of unleashed our entrepreneurial bureaucrats. We're seeing, um, we're seeing cities move faster and more creatively and with more risk-taking uh, tolerance than in normal times. And then we're also seeing philanthropy step forward and saying, if you've got um, a crazy good idea, Mayor, we will help you test it. And if the test shows that it is successful, then we can make the case to bring it back to government to scale and institutionalize. And that's um, part of what I am very excited uh, to do with the mayors for a guaranteed income. You know, this idea of a universal basic income is one that's been kicked around for a while. Government has seemed very reluctant to test it out, but because of COVID, we have some aspects of it. Uh, you know, the federal government did just, you know, stimulus checks to individuals. Right. It's a very similar idea. So clearly people are maybe having a bit more comfort with it. But this is our opportunity to rethink how we support people in meeting their basic needs, especially in high cost places like the Bay Area, where the minimum wage is nowhere near the living wage. Right. Can you talk a little bit about homelessness in Oakland and what the municipal government can do to confront, which is just an obvious and very visible problem? Well, homelessness is another um, just tragedy that has deep ties into structural racism. And I don't think that that's something that a lot of municipalities, and, and remember so much of what we look at when we think about homelessness is tied to county government and, and the county's functions with public health and um, behavioral health and, and the social safety net. But we really need to see how our housing policies have created the housing shortage, which has driven up prices. The fact that such a wealthy country, such a wealthy state, such a wealthy region cannot provide the most basic need of shelter to all people. And, and I want to um, just illustrate this, if you don't mind, with, with a story. Uh, when I began my journey in addressing homelessness, because I, I knew that I, I couldn't just keep saying it's the county's responsibility, uh, Oakland has seen homelessness double in just four years. But I, I met a man whose name was uh, Bishop Emery and he lived under the freeway just a few blocks from the home where he was born and raised with nine other siblings. And, and it was, um, th this story is more common than you would think. We have found through surveys, the vast majority of the homeless in our city are actually from our city, or at least from Alameda County. And when you look at uh, how, for example, public housing doesn't allow extra people to come in on the lease or the over incarceration of African Americans, the, the over charging of them and, and the high bail that's set, all these things that exacerbate uh, the removal of this one group of people that, that is just overly burdened with, with things like uh, a felony on the record which again, limits their housing abilities and even limits the ability of their family members to bring them in and take care of them. Mm. We, we have to see how those, all those uh, different institutions and their failures, particularly for the black and brown populations um, are exacerbating homelessness. So that is one, one lesson we've learned. The other lesson that we've learned is that in order to get people off of the street to come indoors, they really need the four Ps. <laughs> and that is um, they, they, they need to go to bed at night with their possessions safely secured, with their partner, with their pets. And one thing that very few shelters offer is privacy. And so in Oakland, we actually have doubled our shelter capacity 
but by using some innovative models, something called cabin communities and also safe RV parks. And one of the unforeseen benefits of these models is that they are physically distanced. And so when COVID broke out, uh, we saw San Francisco having to move, you know, more than 500 uh, unsheltered people out of shelters and into these emergency hotels because the shelters were not safe and they were having these horrible breakouts. In Oakland, we only had to move 53 people from our traditional shelters because all the new shelter we had done had this privacy piece in it. Hmm. So that that is something that I hope people look at as we start to unravel this absolute travesty of homelessness. And, and the sad thing I will share about Bishop, uh, Bishop uh, Emery, we, we, we got him into one of our very first cabin communities. And then uh, we, we, again, for every cabin community, we have exit resources to try and as quickly as possible get people into public housing uh, or, or, or affordable subsidized housing. And I visited um, Bishop Emery just before Christmas in his first own apartment, one that he could afford. He had the Bible open on his kitchen counter. He was so happy. And then just a couple months later, he, he passed away. Mm. And so every day that we leave people outdoors, especially our elders, especially our disabled, we, we are sending them on a death sentence. This, this is a true urgency. Housing is health, and it's something that we really must attend to. And the silos in government are really um, a, a, a barrier to what really must be a sustainable solution to this. And just sort of those of us who are uninitiated, what is a cabin community? Uh, we use little cabins. I mean, honestly, the first one we did, um, and again, this was a public-private partnership where we're taking risks in Oakland to see what works. We actually use tough sheds. Uh, we don't use tough sheds anymore, but we literally use small little, I, I forget the dimensions, but they're maybe like 12 by 12. They're not big. Uh, they have double-paned windows because they tend to be close to freeways. We've been able to lease um, free land from Caltrans, our, our you know, highway system, double paned windows, drywall, um, sockets so that people can charge their, uh, every, every unsheltered person I know has a cell phone. That is one thing they all have. Uh, but it allows them to go to bed at night. Um, it's two people per cabin, except for after COVID, if people are not in a partnership, then we allow them to have singles. Uh, but people can have their pets, their possessions. They go to bed behind a locked door on each site. Uh, and they're usually 20 uh, cabins, 40 people per site. There are two full-time navigators that are helping people heal and move into permanent housing and move into sustainable income. Uh, and then there's shared, you know, porta potties and a communal tent with a TV and a microwave and two hot meals a day. And that's and then a, a shower that comes by, so that's that's how they work. You can pop them up pretty quickly, and they are about half the cost of a traditional navigation center with pretty much the same rate of actual permanent rehousing. Hmm, interesting. Uh, before we end, I want to turn to the whole question of pension liabilities and retiree health. Now, I know that you and Oakland got a deal with your unions to re put some caps on retiree health, and so I'd like to hear how that came to be. And then quickly, if you could just talk about your relationship with CalPERS and whether it works for the municipality or whether you feel like you're a, um, a pimple on the, on the hide of a big elephant. <laughs> oh, well, that is your analogy, not mine, but I'll take it. Uh, I feel like a pimple. Um, <laughs> but first with the good news, uh, yes, we were uh, and I, I want to uh, give thanks to my former city administrator, Sabrina Landreth, who, I mean, th these things do not happen overnight. Round after round of union negotiations, we have been trying to get some cost sharing on um, the increases in our medical costs, as well as a cap on the retiree medical for our public safety. And we were finally able to get our police union to offer that up. I will be
be honest, we, we did not get it willingly out of our fire union. We actually had to go to binding arbitration and we got it through binding arbitration. But that one change to cap the retiree medical in our very first year when you know our, our actuarial reports were run, our unfunded liabilities were reduced by a quarter billion dollars, $250 million reduction in our long-term liabilities because of that one negotiated change. And I hope that's true. You didn't warn me you were gonna ask me that question, but I have those numbers memorized because I care about these things so much. Um, I, I, I really geek out over unfunded liabilities. Um, and, and you know, I wanna say, um, don't underestimate the intelligence of your constituents. Um, I have really enjoyed, I have a, a little core of, I call them budget ambassadors. And we actually train them up on the complexities of the budget and they go out into their own communities and hold little town halls and bring us back questions. Uh, I think it's really important that people get educated about even these arcane things um, and, and it, it helps when, when you need the public to weigh in, they know what they're talking about and they know why it's so important. Uh, because especially in places with, with you know, term limited politicians, it is very easy to kick that can, can down the road. And as somebody who feels like a few cans landed in my lap, um, let us all take a pledge to think long-term to always keep that long-term vision going. You know, that is my mantra. And as you, you put so well, David, uh, I got dealt many crises uh, as the mayor of Oakland. But every crisis I got, my question I would ask myself, my grounding question is what is in the long-term interest of Oakland, my hometown? Because hmm. I plan to die here. I plan for my children to be able to stay here and thrive hmm. here. And I want everyone's children to be thriving in Oakland. And the decisions that we make today, especially right now, will determine the health and well-being of generations. So let's not just look at our spreadsheets. Let's remember that behind every number is a family, is a person who is striving to meet their basic needs and hopefully do more, and that is thrive. Um, someone put it really well during the uh, Black Lives Matter and the George Floyd protests recently. Uh, she, she, boy, she was, she was angry. And she said, people keep asking why we're burning our community. This isn't our community. We don't own anything. The social contract is broken. So let us fix it. That is what we came to public service to do. Um, so... I should end on that because that was very inspirational, but my tradition in these interviews, and I didn't warn you about this, I'm sorry, is to ask every public official with a job as trying as yours, how you and your husband manage the work-life balance with you when you have two kids, 12 and 14. So what's the, how, how hard is that and what have you found that makes it work, if it works? I hope it works. <laughs> Well, I'm not sure if I um, am an example of good work-life balance. <laughs> I don't know if any mayor is, but I will say I am blessed to have a great partner, one who washes lots of dishes and does the laundry and is a really good cook. Um, my children, you know, definitely have advanced gender norms. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, I, I want to say, you know, we all find our, our motivation, but th this, is, this is my passion. I have always been so in love with my city. I am so proud to be from Oakland. I'm so proud of what Oakland stands for. And so um, it really is just getting the energy from the incredible people I get to work around. Again, I think public service attracts the best and brightest. Um, and, uh, but it, it is wonderful to go home to a very, very happy home with beautiful children, although they are teenagers, so they try me sometimes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think during COVID we're all, um, just recognizing how blessed we are to have families, to have friends. And um, that is 
uh, again, someone who grew up, you know, I, I still have friends. My best friend has been my best friend since fourth grade. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's, that's why we're in this business. Again, not, not the numbers on spreadsheets, but people. And that's, I think, what keeps us all going. Okay, well, uh, Mayor Schaff, thank you very much for your time. And thank your kids for sparing a half hour out of your vacation to join us today. We appreciate it. And we wish you the best of luck in these very trying times. Thank, so thank you, David. And thank you to everyone who's tuning in today. Good luck to us all. So folks, if you just stay with us for a minute or so, we're gonna to transition to the next panel, uh, which will be led by my colleague, Louise Shainer from the Hutchins Center. And we'll look at first the fiscal and uh, issues raised by COVID in state and local governments. And then following that, uh, my co-partner in this project, Rich Rifle from WashU, uh, will turn up with another panel, this one on municipal finance. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.